Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala ekremil enbiya'i vel mursalin. Seyyidina ve Mevlana ve Habibina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. So we're entering once more into the uh, fasting month, setting sail into that uh, fathomless ocean, when everything seems to change and everything in our lives becomes more serious. The angels fly, the demons are changed. It's the time of sabr with all that that implies, a time of restraint. A sawmunis for sabr. As the Holy Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, fasting is half of sabr. This is a hadith in Tirmidhi. And this school, spiritual school of Ramadan, this uh, kind of detox uh, that we experience every year by the grace of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, reminds us of the essential openness of the religion and its capacity to uplift us, to bring us joy, to bring us recentering, to ground us once again. Famous hadith that I've always loved, narrated by Imam Muslim. It's in uh, the hadiths of uh, Sahib, radiallahu an. The Holy Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ajaban li amri al-mu'min, inna amrahu how amazing is the matter of the believer. Everything about him is, is good. And is, this is only for the believer. If something good comes to him, he has shukr, and that's good for him. If something unpleasant comes to him, he has sabr, and that is good for him. This is why religion always correlates very closely to what we nowadays call positive mental health outcomes. Because we're aware that an infinitesimal distance beneath the surface of things, there is goodness, truth, purity, rightness, justice, perfection. And that everything, even though it seems mysterious to us, given our limited perception, is simply uh, an overflowing of the divine plenitude which comes from that perfection, that goodness, that mercy, that rightness, that justice. And this is the meaning of tawakkul. But in our age, human beings are unbalanced. This is the age of imbalance. Nothing is following a sirat mustaqim. Nothing can be characterized as mizan. Everything is tilted one way or another. And on the uh, jumping deck of this ship of humanity through the stormy seas of modernity as we progress, uh, we feel a bit seasick, disoriented. We're not settled. We don't have this istiqrar or this sakina that the human heart always craves. One sign of this imbalance, I think, is the prevalence of anxiety and depression in modern societies. For so many decades, they have led the great carnival of humanity towards a better future, when we will be happier, healthier, more relaxed. But the reality is that prescriptions for antidepressants in the United Kingdom went up twofold in the last 10 years. About 10 million people are on antidepressants one way or another. You have this anxiety epidemic. You have this strange sense that even though outwardly we never had it so good, inwardly we're in turmoil and we don't know where we are from, what we are, where we're going. We are floating in a sea of nothingness. Now we know that fasting is associated with positive mental health outcomes, intermittent fasting as they call it in the 
natural health industry, uh, that it releases serotonin, that it releases endorphins, that it represents the natural way for the brain to be. Human metabolism is not geared up for regular snacks, regular injections of sucrose or whatever else it might be. We are oriented towards occasional healthy meals, not towards the modern habit of grazing. And the brain is designed for that. And as a result, when we're fasting, we get back to the ancient realm of our hunter-gatherer ancestors who would go for a whole day or perhaps longer between meals. Something had to be killed, berries had to be found on bushes or whatever. We're designed for this. And the brain is designed for that world and is healthy when something of that world remains in our lifestyle. So we get back to this amazing world of uh, intermittent fasting and the brain starts to function the way it's supposed to. And also just losing weight. There is also an obesity epidemic in the modern world. Uh, it never used to be the case in this country, but you see more and more people who are clearly not just overweight, but clinically obese. That's also associated with depression, not just because of people's self-image, their body image, but because you know, the, the natural secretion of happiness, enzymes and hormones is, is suppressed. That too is not good for us. Another thing we find in this fasting month is that we memorize more. It's the month of the Qur'an. It's the month particularly when the uh, imam of our mosque really has to make sure that he's not rusty or the embarrassment of stuttering, misplacing something in Allah's book, being corrected by somebody. It's quite a stressful business leading the tarawih. But again, the human brain is designed for memorization. Our ancient ancestors, they didn't have books, they didn't have laptops, they just had the mind and its miraculous capacity to store enormous amounts of material. The brain also is designed to be happy and to secrete uh, those neurotransmitters that make us cheerful when our memory capacities are being used. Those who have memorized enormous quantities in any culture tend to have more positive mental health outcomes. It's an area between the amygdala and the hippocampus, technically speaking, in, in the brain where these neurotransmitters are emitted and that's where the, the memory is thought to be stored. The neuroscientists are starting to realize this. We're designed for this. Concert pianists. Everybody says, why do you have to memorize your text? Why can't the poor imam just have a book in front of him? Interesting, concert pianists also have to become hafiz, as it were. It might be of the works of Bach or Chopin, but they have to perform from memory. And this is one of their anxieties as well. They have their tarawih. Andrea Schiff is performing in the Purcell room and is doing the English suites of Bach and not one note may be out of place or people notice. It's very stressful. And just like the hafiz, they have to practice and rehearse. And generally, a concert pianist has to memorize about 150 works upward. And he can't really have a career if he forgets regularly or if he needs somebody to turn the pages for him. That's just not done. So in Western culture as well, mass memorization is also an esteemed skill. And it's something that comes through regular practice. We should not be rusty in our memorization of Qur'an. Even if we only know a juz or less than a juz, we should make sure, especially in this fasting month, that one of the things we benefit from is just going over what we know, perhaps learning a little bit more. And the brain, which is hungry for things to memorize, will be grateful to us for this. Another aspect of the fasting month is, of course, that it's quite a social time. Britain, the first country in the world with a ministry of loneliness, Quite a shocking thing. But uh, she's pretty busy. We have 3.9 million people who are medically diagnosed with acute loneliness, which is a recognized very serious uh, medical condition. And many millions more who are not really properly socializing. Maybe they'll talk to somebody when they go to the post office, if there is still a post office, if there is still a bank. But this is a very lonely society. Individualism produces 
loneliness <laughs> as a matter of course. Ramadan is a time for sociality, a time for meeting people in the mosque, a time for meeting people at iftar, a time for welcoming friends and family to our homes. It's a very busy time, and in traditional Muslim societies, it's a festive time. After the sun goes round, everybody's in the street and people are selling things, and it's kind of a, a carnival. But not everybody in our communities is properly embedded in a community. Sometimes there are people who are recent arrivals, who are refugees, who are new converts, who don't have those family and neighbourly networks. And we need to look out for them, particularly converts. I know people who have to hide the fact that they're fasting from their parents because their parents simply don't accept their conversion. People I know who have their aid alone, particularly if they're living in fairly remote parts of the country, for whom Ramadan is not a festive time but a time of solitude, a time of loneliness. One thing we can do during this month is to look out for those people. The believer scans the Jama'a and sees who seems to be confused, who doesn't seem to have been there before, who's not talking to anybody, who's struggling with the prayer perhaps, and see if we can make their, their acquaintance, and perhaps invite them for iftar, perhaps make sure that they're not alone at aid time, and remembering that the hadith says, al jamaatu rahma the congregation is mercy. We are social animals, and Islam is a religion of collectivity. It's a religion of the jama'a. So inshallah, these are things that we can remember and be made healthy by in this Ramadan, in this wonderful health-giving time. We can be physically healthier, we can be mentally healthier, we can be socially healthier. And as such, inshallah, we become kal jasad al-wahid, a holy prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, describes this ummah as like a single body. So let us be like that. In our hugely diverse, <laughs> segmented community in modern Britain, let's be united by the fast and let's draw people in. Let's collectively celebrate the gift of brotherhood. Wa kunu ibadallahi ikhwana, the holy prophet says, be Allah's slaves as brothers. And inshallah we will see how happy we are, how we're delivered from anxiety and depression, and inshallah shown the way of sa'ada, sabila sa'ada, the way of felicity in this world as well as in the next, inshallah. And let this be one of the lessons and one of the gifts and one of the blessings of Ramadan for all of us in this time, inshallah. Barakallahu fikum wa taqabbala siyamakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.